This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scripture lesson today comes from 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 through 7 from the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. One day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, As you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. And there we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said. So he went with them, and when they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall, the man of God, the man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. And then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. I'm talking today simply from the subject, recover. 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 What is it that you need to recover in your life? To be able to get back something that you've lost, what needs to be recovered. It is interesting to note that um, as you see recover is coming back and bringing it under the cover of your own auspices of your own control and influence. Go back and get that again. Whenever you find the word re, re means back. Re means back. If, if you think about uh, certain words like respect, re means back, spec means to look. So when you respect, it means that you are looking back. A child, when they grow up, they respect their mom and their dad because of the sacrifices that they had to make for them to actually grow up. When you think about they're sitting up with a sick child, when you think about somebody helping to prepare all of the stuff and helping you with homework and, and dealing with all of the drama that, uh, that's involved in parenting and trying to shield your children from dangers on the internet and drugs and alcohol and, and wild, lewd sex and all of this stuff, you have to look back. When you look back, it ought to cause you to respect. When people start acting in a disrespectful way, it's because they act as though they got to where they are without anybody's help. But when you look back, you realize, I didn't get here alone. Somebody made a sacrifice for me to be where I am today. Somebody made an investment. Somebody taught me. Somebody spent time with me. Somebody helped me when I wasn't feeling well. Somebody guided me when I needed direction. And as you look back, respect, looking back, it causes a respect and an honor to rise in your heart. When you revive something, it means that you bring it back to life. When you restore something, it means that you put it back in inventory, that you restore it. So whenever you find the word re, it means back. When you reconcile or reconcile, it means that you make friends again. When you have had a falling out with someone, when you have been offended at someone and you forgive them, now you can be reconciled, reconciled, made friends again. Thanks be unto God that when our sin created an offense between us and God, he reconciled us through the blood of Jesus. Thank God for making friends again that whatever it is, it's about us being able to come back. We were at a great place with God in the beginning. And now the whole search of man is to be able to get back to that same place of unbroken fellowship and intimacy with him. And so that's the questions that we, we have to ask. What is it? What is it that you need to get back? And uh, what did, th th that you need to get back that you have left, that you have abandoned, that you've stopped doing, that you've fallen out of commitment with? And so, as, as we listen today, we, uh, we, we, we are learning through what I would call expository teaching. And that's where you take your time and you just go verse by verse through the text. Uh, the faster that you go, the more you miss. 
So there are times that you have to just slow down, slow down. Uh, the slower you go, the faster you learn. The slower you go, the faster you learn. So let's look at verse 1 here. One day, uh, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Here's what I want you to see, is that discomfort is a call to change, to expand, and to grow. Whenever you have experienced discomfort, it means that you need to change something. That's why the moment that when a woman has on heels and when she gets to her car, she doesn't even wait till she gets to the house. When she gets to the car, the discomfort moves her to slide that heel off. I don't care how sharp it is. When it's uncomfortable, when you get to the car, you slide the shoes off. Discomfort will cause you to change. It will cause you to expand. It will cause you to grow. It is true with your children and their feet. Have you ever noticed that when shoes become too uncomfortable, then we know it's time to change them. It happens with your body uh, when you've been, uh, you know, dealing with pandemic weight and, uh, and some things are, are not fitting as loosely and as comfortably as they used to. And so when you get uncomfortable in your clothing, it's time to change, to expand, to grow from the 12 to the 14. You've got to just break down. It's, I know you don't want to go there. You don't want to go another step up. But it's, if you want to be comfortable, if you want to be comfortable, either that you're going to have to get you some of that strong, what's the new uh, girdle stuff that these women wear? I, I, uh, spanks and all of that kind of stuff. You know, you're going to have to bind it up. But as soon as you bind that up, as soon as you get to a private place, you're going to have to change. And off it comes and loose it comes. You know, you can't even enjoy your food until you loosen things up. Isn't it interesting that even when your mindset changes, when your understanding changes, you become uncomfortable around trifling people. Have you ever noticed that? The more you grow, the more that uh, you have to change some things. When your spirit grows, uh, you, you no longer are comfortable around a lot of worldly and carnal kinds of, of things. And so what we discover is that de uh, dissatisfaction is a precursor for change. Dissatisfaction, it is actually a precursor for change. You know that when you become dissatisfied and uncomfortable, it is... A, a, a call that you've got to change something. The way that God deals with us in our life, our life begins to move from comfort to discomfort to then greater comfort. In that order, you go from comfort to discomfort to greater comfort. If you're going to shift from one job to another job or shifting careers, you go from comfort to discomfort to then greater comfort. So we have to be able to, to be uncomfortable for a season. All growth involves change. You can change without growing, but you cannot grow without changing. And this was a great sign of the sons of the prophet of Elisha saying that, hey, the place where we are is too small. You will start realizing and become aware of the fact that the place where you are is small. You don't realize that until you grow. I went back to my elementary school to speak in the auditorium that I used to go to, and I'm telling you, it, it used to feel like the Mercedes-Benz Stadium to me downtown. And when I went back to speak, it seemed like it was as small as a classroom. It seemed so small. It's not that the walls had closed in. They didn't change sizes. I grew. When I grew, I went back to the place that felt big to me, and all of a sudden now, it felt small. The same thing happened when I went back to my high school to speak. In this big gym, uh, gymnasium, when I used to go there, and I was the president of the student body and would sometimes speak to the 2,000 students there, and it seemed like a massive kind of a place to me. And this place is bigger than that place. It's amazing. And when I went back, it, the place seemed small to me, not because it had changed any of its dimensions, but because I had grown. You see, the issue is, it's not that our problems are too big. The problem in our world today is the people that try, who are trying to solve them are too small. 
And so we just need people to be able to grow bigger than what the problem is so that they can then go back and then handle the problem. But discomfort is always a step that is necessary for bringing you to greater comfort. So don't fight it. Let's notice verse 2. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. He said, all right, he told them, go ahead. Listen, all change begins with a decision. All change begins with a decision. If you're going to improve your life, if you're going to grow, you're going to have to make a decision to grow. Growth is never just an automatic thing. You have to decide that I'm going to change, that I'm going to grow, that I'm going to expand. I could have stayed in the same place that I was teaching the Bible when I was 14 years old. But I said, you know what? As I'm growing, the ministry is going to grow. And so the, the place had to change. I couldn't have stayed there and accommodated and reached what God had assigned for me to be able to reach had I stayed in the same place. And even the walls of the church became a confining place. And that's why we went on television. And that's why we're on the internet. Because that then be began to expand the world. And now uh, my teachings, my philosophies, that my Christianity now comes under fire. It comes under the critique of other people that believe in a different way. But it's because my world has expanded. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for people that know my personality in the local church here, but then somebody who's out there that hasn't heard me before and they're hearing me for the first time, and then I say something that folks understand my heart here, and then somebody there said, oh, can you believe that he said that? And it's amazing. But so you have to get uncomfortable if your world is going to expand because here's a principle that growth demands a new environment. Growth demands a new environment. Whenever you grow, it demands a new environment. And so that's why the sons of the prophet said, let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs and there we can build a new place for us to meet because they were growing and it demanded a new environment. It's the same thing that a baby does in a mother's womb. As it is growing, it is saying, uterus, expand to accommodate me because I'm growing. I'm growing. When it first starts off, a woman can't even tell she's pregnant. She's not even showing. But after a while, you're going to have some, some pushing out. And the baby uh, will come to a place where they're showing. No, no, no. The showing is a result of somebody growing. And your growing ought to show. Your growing ought to show. But growth demands a new environment. It demands a new environment. It's true of children. It's, it's true of students. It's true of employees. It's true of anybody who's chasing after God. It demands a new environment. The more that you grow, you've got to find, you know, you start off and your mom and your dad are your, are your first teachers, but they don't know everything that you perhaps need to know. And so that's why you have to expand out because we go to school then and we, we start reading other people's books and ideas because growth demands a new environment. And so whenever you start growing, you're going to have to go into new environments because it is exploring new environments that starts teaching you even new things and allowing you a freedom to be able to explore and to grow into greater dimensions. So growth often demands something new beginning with the environment, new associations oftentimes, a new diet of positive content coming into your, into your spirit, a new mindset. Growth demands a new environment. When you start getting infused with the Spirit of God, you become unsettled with the baby food because growth demands a new environment. I remember visiting my cousin in St. Louis one time, and she had three young children at the time, and, and she fixed breakfast for us. And, uh, and when she handed me the plate, it was a wonderful plate of, of, of pancakes, and then I, I noticed she had cut my food up because she was in the habit of cutting her pancakes up for the, for the children. And I mean, my feet was all, it's in, already cut up in bite sizes. I'm like, I'm a grown man. <laughs> and my food, you see, and I had grown. I, I wouldn't have noticed that unless I had grown to the place where I could cut up my own pancakes. And when somebody did it for me, it set me back. I'm like, is this a child's plate? But she's forgotten because she was so in the habit of cutting up the food for her, her three children. And so here I am, a grown man now with my plate of pancakes all cut up in bite sizes. And I, I recognized that as something odd only because I had grown. 
to be able to cut up my own food. And so I don't want to eat any uh, uh, food from a, that's a designed for a baby that's already been pre-blended and put in a jar. I can masticate my own. Just, just give it to me. I know what to do with it. I can handle it. I've grown. But growth demands a new environment. And whenever you grow, growth also will introduce you to new problems. It will introduce you to new problems. I know that you don't want to be under your mom and daddy's roof anymore, but when you get out into the real world now, now you've got to figure out rent or mortgage. That's a new problem. Now you've got to figure out trying to pay your own insurance. Now you've got to figure out paying utilities for the first time. I'm just telling you, growth introduces you to new problems, new problems. Here's what I would say to you. Problems are an invitation to think, to pray, and to grow. Problems. That's all they are. It's just an invitation for you to think, pray, and grow. So allow the problems to come because they go with the territory. Problems help you to grow. If you never had any problems, you wouldn't grow. You've got to have some problems, some, something that challenges your current existence. And listen, please don't wait until New Year's to think that I've got to wait until the new year comes in before I can reset my life. No, no, no. All change begins with a decision. You don't have to wait till Monday morning. You can make a decision that this is the last day that I'm going to live like this. You can make a decision right now, right this moment, that as I am learning, I'm going to grow and I'm going to put it into action. I'm getting ready to change. I don't have to wait the first of the year, the first of the month, the first of the week. You can change your mindset at any moment. I'm just telling you, I have to reset myself all the time. I, I, you know, you can be minding your own business, praising the Lord and thankful. But do you know that there are unhappy, nasty people in the world? And why would I allow an encounter, five minutes of an encounter with a cantankerous, unhappy soul to ruin my day for the rest of the day, still thinking about something nasty and insulting and rude and unkind and untrue that may have been said to me or about me? Why would I want to dwell on that all day long? It offends you in that moment, but why would I want to carry that and then go into my office and be offensive to other people? and still having an attitude now when I get back home over a three-minute encounter with somebody. It could have been the way that some a, a waitress served you in a restaurant or somebody that you go to a cashier and they sort of threw your, your change back at you and, and now you, you've been out of shape the rest of the day. Or because a police officer pulled you over and gave you a ticket, now your whole day is, is ruined. You have to reset. You can reset your life at any moment. And I've had to stop when I've been pulled over by a police officer. I had one of the most courteous officers to pull me over and he was so courteous that I was actually shocked when he gave me the ticket. <laughs> but at least because he was courteous, it didn't ruin my day. I was not excited and thrilled about the fact that I had been given the ticket, but at least I was able to reset my attitude. I was on my way to class that day, and I didn't want to get to class with an attitude still bent out of shape over what had happened on my way trying to get to class on time. So I reset. You don't have to wait for a special occasion to reset. You don't have to wait for your 18th birthday, your 21st birthday, your 40th birthday, or 50th, or whenever it is. You can reset it. At any moment that you realize my attitude is poor right now. Because a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You're not going to go any place until you change it. And you have the power to be able to say, you know what, right now I'm getting ready to change this attitude. The flatness of it, the poison of it, the, the offense of it, I'm changing it right now in this moment. I choose to change it now. Not when the government moves and sends me another stimulus check. I change it now. I'm not going to die standing back waiting on somebody else to do something do what's within your realm of control. That shows growth when you can be responsible to say, I'm in charge of this moment now. And my attitude is nobody's responsibility but mine. Own it so you can control it. Look at verse 3. The students here of Elisha said, please come with us, someone suggested. And he said, I will. 
Here's the principle that I want to get you from that. Leave your comfort zone, but don't leave your strength zone. Leave your comfort zone, but don't leave your strength zone. You see, Elisha is their mentor. He is their spiritual father. He is their coach that is making them better. What Olympian would dare go to the Olympics without his coach, without her coach? Who? Why? Why would you go into an expanding opportunity and not carry your coach? And so they, they said, please come with us, come with us. They took the voice of, of wisdom, of understanding, of discernment. They took that voice of reason. They took the voice of prophetic insight with them. So leave your comfort zone, but don't leave your strength zone. Because the folks that God has assigned to your life to help you, they're a part of your strength. Don't forsake the, the people that God has assigned to help you to get to where you get in life because God will always call people to help you. And so, uh, otherwise, this man was all been out of shape because he had lost his, his axe head. It had slipped off of the tool. Don't make everything about the tool because... We are all just a tool in the hand of God. God is the master architect. He's the master sculptor. Wouldn't it have been foolish uh, when Michelangelo took a solid hunk of marble and then hewn out of that the sculpture of King David? And when he did that, and it was a masterpiece and still is praised and celebrated to this day, they don't talk about the chisel nor the hammer that he used. Those were just tools. They talk about Michelangelo, the master sculptor. It was in his mind. The tools were just expendable things that was in the hand of the sculptor. Nobody praises and said, my God, my God, wonder what kind of chisel was used here. I wonder what kind of hammer they used here. No, they talked about the master craftsmanship, the incredible attention to detail that was created by Michelangelo. They talked about the master. And we are the same way. Jesus is the master. He's the master. We are tools in his hands. We are expendable. And so nobody, when somebody gets saved, if God uses you to bring somebody to salvation, it was Jesus' blood. He had a master plan. We're just telling them about something that he's already done. We're just going there telling we're just an instrument in the hand of God. Don't get so attached to the instrument. Stay connected to the one that leads you into those things. And that's why they said, Elisha, come on and go with us because you're the one that's giving us a design for our life here. You're the one who's connected to God. He's the one that is, uh, God is using you in our life to be able to guide us and to direct us and to mature us into prophetic ministry. And so he was using them. So always stay connected. Stay connected to the people that God has brought into your life to be able to speak into your life and to give guidance into your life and encouragement into your life. Always stay connected. If you will show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. If you wonder where you're going, take a look at the five closest people around you who are really connected in your life that you spend time with, that you converse with. Take a look. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Notice verse 4 here. So he went with them, and when they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. See, this is why you can't just have a cursory reading of the Scriptures. When I uh, uh, read the Scriptures, I take my time and, and try to digest them, just like a cow. A cow has four stomachs where they ruminate whatever they will have ingested into their mouth, it is digested and broken down over four different stomachs. So they, they, they are ruminating on this. And so when you get a verse of scripture, ruminate on it and you'll get more out of that scripture. Don't just look at something just because it said, and so he went with them and they arrived at the Jordan and he began cutting uh, down trees. Here's what a principle that speaks to me out of that powerfully is that you can't build something up without breaking something down. 
You can't build something up without breaking something down. It is true of muscles. You got to break down tissue before you build up your muscle. Your muscles get all sore and you're worn out. You have to wear the muscle out. You got to break it down in order to build it up. It is true of your business. You got to break something down in order to build it up. It's true of developing your life. You got to break something down before you can build it up. And you see, it's true even of the building of this facility. It had to be broken down into architectural plans into a, an electrical plan. We had a plumbing plan. We had a kitchen plan. We had a lighting plan. Uh, uh, there were so many, a seating plan. We, we had all kinds of a technology plan. There were so many different plans. Before we could build it up, we had to deconstruct it and build it down. So it's, it's almost like a recipe where you're instructing somebody how to fix grandmama's incredible pound cake. And if they've never baked before, they need to be told you've got to preheat the oven to 350. And then you want to grease that pan with a stick of butter. And then you want to put some flour on. And you have to walk them through every single step as though they have never, ever done it. You've got to break it down before they can build it up. And don't open that oven door because it can fall. Your cake can fall. You've got to be able to walk them through every single process. Break it down so they can build it up. Something always has to come down in order for you to build something up. Does that make sense to you? And so he's just teaching us just some simple principles here that any true endeavor in life that you want to really build up, you got to cut something down. If you want to build a relationship with a new person, you don't get any more time. That means you're going to have to decrease some of the time that you've been giving your current relationships. You only have so much time. And so in order to increase here, you've got to decrease. You remember John the, uh, uh, the Baptist when he saw Jesus? He said, he must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. You can't have everything staying the same length, the same level. When one thing goes up, something else comes down. There has to be a balance in God. So they knew that I got to build something up, so that means I've got to take something down. When I, when I came to this property years ago, this was a forest, trees, and rocks. And I, I, little did I know that we're going to have to spend $2 million to blast rock out of the ground here on these grounds before we could start building anything. It was a forest to me when I walked around it, but yet I knew in my spirit that God had led me to this place. I went to another place and, uh, and I, I walked the land and I, I was waiting on the Holy Ghost to speak to me and he said nothing. And then I went to another location and I walked the land and I waited on the Holy Ghost to say something to me and he said nothing. But when I came here, and walked the ground. Ha! Glory. I felt something in my shadana. I just knew that this was the place that God destined me to build on the west gate of Atlanta. I understood divinely when I couldn't see anything here but trees. There was nothing but trees all over this place. And yet I saw something. That I knew that had to come down in order for us to build this up. Whenever you're going to build, something has to come down so that something else can go up. And that's why when relationships come into a stalemate, somebody has to lower their pride so that the relationship can live. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I'm just telling you, something has to be cut down in order for something else to live. Notice verse 5. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. It was a borrowed axe. Here's what I want you to understand. The axe head fell off. He's chopping a tree down. He's chopping a tree down. And he goes to swing, and he swings really hard. And the, the iron axe head flips off and goes up into the water. You know... Someone said that if you give a man eight hours to chop down a tree, he'll spend seven hours sharpening the blade. And it's interesting. The Bible talks about just that word borrowed, that it was a borrowed. He was really upset, not really because he lost it, but you know, you hate. It's one thing when you lose something that's yours. It's another thing if you borrow somebody's car and then total it. Or you borrow somebody's car and it gets stolen. I mean, you'd rather lose your own than to lose something that somebody entrusted to you. And so this is where the, the, the man is. He said, hey, you know, I'm really upset now because the ax head. What is the ax head? The ax head is a cutting edge. 
It's a cutting edge. And I want you to understand just from this verse that the axe head is borrowed always. You never own the cutting edge. God only lends it to you for a season. And that's why while it is your season, you better work your magic. You better do your thing. You better make it do what it do while you've got the cutting edge. Because if you don't ride that horse while it can be ridden, somebody else is going to come with a faster, stronger horse. I'm just telling you, Apple, somebody is coming after you one day. Somebody is coming after you. You may have a cutting edge today. Google, you may have a cutting edge today. Tesla, you might have a cutting edge today. But somebody is watching you. Somebody is working on something right now, trying to figure out how they can steal your place. It's hard to get to number one, and it's harder to stay at number one because somebody is learning from you, and somebody is going to build on your success and look at your weaknesses and find something that is bigger and better and faster and cheaper, and they are working on it as a cutting edge. They've got new technology, they've got new designers, and they are hiring somebody right now working on trying to take your place. That's why you have to realize my cutting edge is only for a season. I won't always be the man here at Word of Faith. I understand that. I'm not convoluted by that. I'm okay with it, but it's my season, and I'm going to ride it while it's my season. I'm going to finish my assignment. I'm going to fight my fight and fit run my course and finish it in the name of Jesus. But I realize that there are others that have a cutting edge and somebody that's younger and stronger and sharper and more creative and more gifted is coming along. And after a while, it's going to be talking about somebody else. At one time, it was Michael Jackson. And the next time, it was Justin Bieber. And the next time, listen, and now is Beyonce. And now is this one and that one and the other one. It's just for a season. Because somebody else is going to come on the season, on the, on the plat, uh, platform behind them and is going to be able to rap better than they can rap. And it's going to have a different twist to what they do. And somebody else is going to come with an instrument and they're going to be able to play and sing and dance at the same time and rap on top of that. And then they'll be able to do it faster and be able to get it to you faster and cheaper. And it's going to, it's somebody is always working on a cutting edge. And that's why if you've got a cutting edge right now that is chopping things down to build things up, you better ride your cutting edge. You better use it while you've got it because it is borrowed. You don't own it. You've got to use it as long as it's being granted time for you to use. And then the thing that you'll understand about a cutting edge is that sometimes you've got a cutting edge in one area and then God will use you there all of your life. But then he'll bring you after a certain season and he will switch you into something that has little to do with what you've done all of your life and bring you into another dimension. Anybody understand what I'm talking about today? And now you have to trust God all over again in order for him to bring you into a new season with a new cutting edge. Because sometimes in order to figure out how to make something better, you got to have fresh eyes on it. Because when you've been doing it all the time and coming in and looking at it all the time, uh, you, you, you lose sight of it. You become blind to opportunities. And a new kid on the block coming in and say, hey, why don't we do this? And they'll come in with an idea. And now God is about to shift some of you into brand new areas of your life where you've not been before. For, and you're going to see opportunities that others who've been there for a long time that has not seen the opportunity and they're going to wonder hey I wonder who is this where did they come up with that from wonder why I didn't think about this maybe God has hidden some things for you to give you a cutting edge so even if you lose one cutting edge if you walk with him He's got another cutting edge. And if everything that you lost over here, God will give you something on this next level that will be able, instead of it being a, 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 an axe head, maybe it will be a chainsaw. And you'll be able to cut down even more this time because somebody is working to make something better and faster and easier. And I'm here to tell you that maybe, just maybe, God will ship you into another dimension of life where you got more life experience, more uh, wisdom, more experience, more failure that has taught you more wisdom than anything in your life. And you are ready now with a sharpened cutting edge. And you realize now I'm not starting over. I'm starting again. 
I'm not starting from scratch. I'm starting from experience. I got something this time that I realize he's with me. And the last cutting edge that I had, God is going to use now a new axe head in my life and allow me to make some headway for the glory of his kingdom. Look at verse 6. He said, where did it fall? The man of God asked. And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. And then the axe head floated to the surface. And here's what I would say to you just from this verse. Go back to where you lost your cutting edge and put a stick to it. It's real simple. Go back to where you lost it and stick to it. Go back to your core and stick to it. Go back to your why and stick to it. Why did you fall in love before? Go back to it and stick to it. Go back, put a stick to it. Stick to it. You lost your passion because you stopped sticking to, to, to your core. You lost your passion because you start doing some other stuff that he didn't tell you about doing. Go back to your core. Go back and put a stick to it. Go back to where it fell off. Go back, go back to it, to where it fell off. Where did you lose the cutting edge? You used to be sharp. You used to be passionate. You used to be on fire. But then you lost it. Where? Where did you lose it? Most of you, if somebody asks you, you know exactly where you were when you lost it. You know that I was 32 years old. You know that I was this age or I was that age and I was over here when I went off to college. You know that when I went, I moved to another city. You know exactly where you lost it. Go back, he said, to where you used to be on fire for me. Go back where you used to be passionate. Go back to where you didn't have anything but me and you had to trust me. Go back to that place and depend on me like it, your very life depends on it. Go back to the place that you lost it and put a stick to it. Go back and stick to your prayer. Go back and stick to confessions. Go back and stick to studying the Word of God. Go back to tithing. Go back, go back and stick to it. Go back to it and stick to it. Go back and find the place and stick to it. Find the place where you were winning and stick to what you were doing. Go back to your core. Go back, go back, go back. And uh, when you do go back, you'll discover that God was just really sending you back to the basics. Because so many people have begun to fail because they walked away from their basics. It amazes me when people have started doing well when they came out of nothing. And all of a sudden they start putting God on a back burner. And God says, hey, go back to your basics. Go back to your core before you had degrees. Go back before you had advanced training and special seminars for this and, and more sophisticated equipment and computers. Go back when you had to trust me. When nobody, it was you and a few of your family members. Go back. When it was just you and a friend. Go back, go back, go back. The way you prayed then. Like your life depended on it. Like your life depended on it. Go back, go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. And then notice what he says in verse 7. He says, grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. Here's what I want you to get from that. When your cutting edge resurfaces, grab it. When your cutting edge resurfaces, grab it. You know why I say that? Because the opportunity of a lifetime is only available during the lifetime of the opportunity. When it resurfaces, grab it. You've got to seize the moment. When it floats back up, because if you don't get it, somebody else will. If you don't get it, it might float away. If you don't get it, it might sink once again. Whenever God causes something to come to the surface, grab it. You got to be able to say, God, I, I hear you. Because God will speak to you at 2.38 in the morning. And if you don't get up and grab it and put it down on paper, you wake up in the next morning and say, you know what? God woke me up and told me something I can't remember for the life of me what he told me. I'm telling you, it'll be like a cloud of smoke. That's why he says, when you see it come up, grab it, grab it, grab it. God has a way of allowing your cutting edge, the very thing that made you sharp. He says, when you see that I'll bring it back up, grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. Just when you thought that it was lost, I declare to you in the name of Jesus that I see some people in this place today that are going to be just like a Samson who messed up and fooled around and wasted so much time and, and dissipated his life on a whole bunch of women all of his life. But then when he came to the end of his life, he said, he prayed. He asked for a little lad to place his hands because they had gouged his eyes out. And the little boy could see, but he wasn't strong. 
Samson was strong, but he couldn't see. And he said, place my hands on the central pillars of this place. Position me. And then he looked up toward heaven and said, God, you've given me my strength as my cutting edge. I lost it when I disobeyed you, when I broke covenant with you. But he said, God, if you'll one more time, if you'll just do it one more time. You ought to be able to finish well. I messed up all of my life, Jesus, but just this one time. This last time, Lord, if you'll ever position my hand, just let me get into place. Don't start pushing until you're into place. If you're pregnant with something from God, don't start pushing until you're fully dilated, 100%, 100% effaced and 10 centimeters dilated. Don't start pushing until God has placed you. But when he has placed you, if you said, God, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You did it while I was young, Lord. Do it again. I've lost my vision. I don't even know what to do, but Jesus place my hand. I don't know who I'm talking to in this place today. You don't really know which way to go. You don't know what to put your energy and your effort behind, but I declare to you in the name of Jesus, God has an anointing and he said that the latter will be greater than the first. There was an early rain and a latter rain. Now you got more sense. Now you got more humility. Now you got more perspective. Now you got more understanding. Now he said if you will now just place my hand. Show me, God. Show me in my final years. Show me in my final days. Show me in my final moments, God. Where to place my hand. Help me, God, to be able to push. I want to be able to do more in my going out than I ever did in my coming up. If you'll bring me, God, just position my hands in the name of Jesus. And once he did, he did. And God did, and he killed more in his death than he ever did in his life. When your cutting edge resurfaces, grab it. Grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. Because there are some things that you need to recover. For some of you, it is your health. But here's what the Lord said in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 17. I will restore health to you, says the Lord, and I will heal you of your wounds. I'll restore your health. I will restore health unto you. I will restore health unto you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus I will restore health to you there are some individuals that are receiving right now right now right now healing in a, a pain from an injury in your lower back God is healing some spines right now in the name of Jesus I, 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 Jehovah Rapha is stepped in the building now uh, there's some that have been dealing with a, a, what I would call, a, a, I don't know the medical term, but you, you'd call it frozen shoulder, where you have limited range of motion and can only go so high. Start moving that in the name of Jesus. Watch what Jehovah does. Watch him. Watch him. Jehovah Rapha. He's a healer. He said, I will restore health unto you and heal you. I will restore health unto you and heal you. I will restore health unto you and heal you. He said in Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, that I era bosiondelea. I will restore the years, years, years that the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the canker worm, the locust has eaten up. God says, I'll be able to restore your time. You'll be able to recover your health. God said, I will give you more years added onto your life. I'll begin to fix some stuff that has been breaking down in you. I'll bring healing. I'll give you back some range of motion that you haven't been able to have in a long time. You watch what God would do. He's still a healer. He's still healing tumors. He's still healing livers. He's still healing bladders. He's still healing pancreas. God is still healing hearts. He is a healer. If you need to have him to recover you in some area, I declare in the name of Jesus, it's time now to go back to wherever you lost it.
and put her stick to it. Put her stick to it. Stick your faith there. Stick your prayer there. Stick your believing there. To say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. Some trust in chariots and horses, but I trust in the name of the Lord. When you trust him, when you don't even know how the outcome is going to be, God will move miraculously on your behalf. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Stretch your faith out on God and let him do something in you. Let him move in your body. Let him move in your body. Let him move in your body. He's moving in digestive systems right now, healing digestive disorders. You let him recover you. God wants to recover you. He wants to recover the hormones in your body that have been out of balance, that have been causing deep mood swings this way and that way and interrupting your ability to sleep. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I feel him healing now, right now, right now, right now. God's doing something. Some of you lost your passion. You've gotten stuck. You don't even know how to get out of the funk that you're in. You're in a malaise and you're just saying, I, I don't know why I don't even feel like doing anything. You need to recover your joy. You need to recover your passion. You lost it somewhere along, along the line. And I want you to know that he, it can be recovered. It's not dead. It's able to be recovered. It's able to be recovered in the name of Jesus. It's able to be recovered. What God covered, He covered us under the shadow of the Almighty. And we run away to do our own things, spreading our wings instead of trusting under His wings. But now you can be recovered under the wings of Him. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. And in Him will I trust. Oh my God, I feel God in this place recovering some of your dreams that you thought is too late now. It's never too late for God. 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 Just a little while ago, I was listening to a Spanish podcast of an 80-year-old woman that had been singing all of her life in her home, but her daddy told her, women, women don't sing in public. And she'd never sung. She had kept it silent all of her life. And she had a musical grandson that had a band. And he says, Grandma, I want to feature you. And added her name onto his group. And she came out and sang her first song in public at 80 years old. And got nominated for a Latin Grammy. It's never too late. It's never too late to recover what's been lost. Some of you that have been in a funk and you just can't even get yourself out. You don't know what's wrong with you. You're just stuck. There's an anointing that's in this place today. Ha! Shokomondi! To get you unstuck. This doesn't happen by the arm of the flesh. This happens by the arm of the spirit of the living God. If you submit to him, I declare to you, you'll get free today. Not next week. Today. Today. That thing can break off of your life today. That lethargy. That dragging around. That wallowing around. And not being, and you don't know what's wrong with you in the name of Jesus. 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 If that's you, come, 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 come. Get out here in this anointing. Come on in Jesus' name. Come on in Jesus' name. Stuck folks. Stuck folks. Stuck folks. Come, 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 come. Come, 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 come. Come, 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 come. 
Ropo banjo. It's time now to get unstuck in the name of Jesus. It's time to get unstuck in the name of Jesus. It's time to get unstuck in the name of Jesus. In the name, in the name, in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You need a divine encounter. You need a touch of the holy. I pray in the name of Jesus. 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 My God, he's bottled up your anointing. He's stifled your creativity. You've been dealing with writer's block. You can't get in the flow of what you need. You can't think straight. You're dealing with a mental fog. In the name of Ashekele Mondo Lavoche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, the Kia Shaka. Robo Shikiliata. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the Christ. Today, 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 I speak to every foul spirit that has been assigned against your life. I decree and declare, I take authority in the name of Jesus over every devil, over every hex, over every curse, over every open door to Satan that has been placed in your life. I close that door. I cancel that assignment. I renounce the power of the enemy over your life in the name of Jesus. I take authority. I break its power. I sever it now. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. Lethargy, go. Mental fall, go. Writer's block, go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Cut out every unclean spirit. Ibrosikiata. Mondekeya shaka. Morate yakea moso. Roposhe. Rike shekeyata. Motaliakea. More shikeya. Monsekeata. Motaya. Be open. Be open. Be open. Be open. Be open. Shea mande. Yakayapo. Efrata kea se. Monsokuliates. Motaya. Never again, never again. Open, open, open. Flow, flow. Shia, be shia, be shia. Flow, flow, flow. Shia taya ya, mo shia taya. May he set you free. May he set you free. May he open you up. May you go back to that place and better stick to it in the name of Jesus. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick, or lame. We renounce every work of darkness, every work of witchcraft, every work of repetitive, addictive sin. We renounce it. We renounce it of involvement in the occult. We come rekita mosikiata. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we break every soul tie, every soul tie, every soul tie. Every soul tire, every soul tire, every soul tire, every soul tire. I saw an angel from heaven with a sword. Slicing, severing, breaking the cord, breaking the tire, breaking it, 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 breaking it in the name of Jesus, breaking it in the name of Jesus, breaking it in the name of Jesus. Breaking it in the name of Jesus. We declare it. We declare it. We declare it. May the freedom of the Lord flow in this place. May the freedom of the Lord flow in this place. May the freedom of the Lord flow in this place. There have been some of you that have been bottled up emotionally. You've come to a place of indifference in your life. You've been hurt so much and hurt so deeply. You've not even been able to cry. But God said today your tears will flow from your eyes. Tears. Tears. He takes that stony heart and turns it into a heart of flesh. He heals you today. He heals you today. He heals you today. He heals you today. He heals the hurt. He heals the offense. He heals the unforgiveness. He heals. He heals. He heals. Let it go. 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 
the name of Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Psalm 61 said that when my heart is overwhelmed, I go to the rock. When my heart is overwhelmed, I go to the rock. When my heart is overwhelmed, I go to the rock. Lord, you who are my shelter, we go to the rock. Psalm 61 too. I go to the rock. When my heart is overwhelmed, I go to the rock. Some of you have been living and now life has overwhelmed your heart. It's time for you now to go to the rock. The rock of your salvation, who is solid, not shifted, not unstable, not unpredictable, not insecure. You've come to the rock today. He sets your feet on a solid rock. Solid rock. Solid rock. Solid rock. Solid rock. rock. May I remind you today of the word of the Lord? He said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is a Greek word, so-so. It means to be saved, to be healed. It means to be delivered, 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 set free. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be set free. I want you to let the depth of your pain, the depth of your abandonment, the depth of your insecurity, cry out to God, just call his name. When I count to three, I want a cry to come out of your belly, calling just the name Jesus, Yeshua. Cry out of your belly, one. Cry out of your belly, two. When it gets ready to three, Come on, three, Jesus, Jesus, yeah, 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 Moshika, ma, yeah, 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 Moshika, yeah, Mandelele, Moshika, Manjake, Bori, Rabai, yeah, 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 that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, Moshika, 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 be Shaka, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 call that name, call that name, call that name, yes, Woo! glory. I heard the Lord said that it's recovery time. Some of you all have dealt with your issues for so long that you've written it off as though I've just got to live with this. The devil is a liar. Hey, ya baba shiko. You don't, you don't. He's still Jehovah Rapha. He's still a healer. He's still, I don't care how long you've dealt with it. I don't care how long you have dealt with it. Today, 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 it is finished. 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 It is finished in Jesus' name. Say it with your mouth. It's finished. Say it. It is finished. Type it. It is finished. 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 It's finished. Feel his presence of his peace dropping in. 
peace, 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 peace. Ha shokoma de kilebosa. I feel this peace. Stress, anxiety, peace. Tormenting thoughts, peace. Memories of hurt, peace. Peace. Thinking about who died and left you, peace. <laughs> Thinking about when you've been treated unfairly, peace. Peace. Lying awake at night, stressed, peace, 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 oh, peace. He's calling for peace. Shekromati Asato. Peace, Jehovah Shalom. Peace, oh, peace, oh. Hashikoma, he's in the place. Peace. Peace. Oh, oh, Lord, peace. We're calling for peace in our bodies. Peace in our minds. Peace in our heart. Peace in our world. Oh, peace. Like a river. Peace that stills the storm. Peace that's all night long. Peace. He's calling for peace. Uh, everybody who's been living without it. Peace. He's calling peace. Oh, oh, Lord, peace. It belongs to you. Peace is not something that you get out of a bottle nor a syringe. Peace is a person. His name is Jesus. Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of peace. Jesus is a prince of peace. He brings peace about trying to figure everything out. Peace. Peace. All of the hell that's been going on in your household. Arguments in your relationship. Peace. Peace, peace, peace is calling for peace all over me. Is calling for peace, peace, wonderful peace all over me. He's calling for peace. Ha! Shikoma! Peace. Lord, peace all over me. That's you and your household. Peace on your job. Peace in your neighborhood. Peace in the school. Peace all over me, Jesus. Peace. Ha! Peace. Ha! Peace of mind. Thank you, Jesus. Father, now what you have begun in this hour, may this anointing rest on your people. May they take it back to their household. Decree it in every room of the house. May your peace, God, rest in them. And may a spirit of recovery, God, help them to identify everything that they've lost so that they can go back and put a stick to it. Lord, in the name of Jesus, empower them once again to be everything that you've called them to be. 
to do what you've called them to do, Lord God. I speak recovery in their life. Recover me of lost finances, of lost and unused gifts. Recovery, 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 recovery of sight to the blind, of those things that they fail to see by vision, God, those things that they didn't hear by the Spirit. Recover, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Peace, oh God. Oh God. Recover the sleepless nights. Recover the time lost. Recover. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, their health, their healing. Recover. Peace. Ah. Peace. Peace all over me. He's sending peace. Peace. Peace all over me. He's calling peace. Peace. Peace all over me. He's calling for peace. Sending peace in your home. Peace in the marriage. Jesus is Prince of Peace. He moves in peace. He brings peace. 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 Rest in the peace on you. May you go in peace. Blessings to you. We'll see you next week. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.